why did the Gossip Girl revival fail? On January 19th, 2023, it was announced that HBO Max would be canceling their Gossip Girl revival after only two seasons, a decision that I hardly found to be a surprise considering the public's less than stellar reaction to the series. Now set in the 2020s, the revival featured an entirely new cast of characters, but was still set in the same continuity as the original series. The revival set out to highlight how things had changed in the years since the original show's conclusion back in 2013, not only in regard to social media, privacy, and fame, but also the television landscape itself, with the show featuring a more diverse cast, politically correct messaging, and adult content. While this wasn't the worst idea in the world, the show struggled to find its footing and was utterly unable to step out of the shadow of its predecessor. And with its cancellation, it's fated to disappear into the ever-growing ash heap of other failed revivals, reboots, and remakes. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the Gossip Girl revival and the many missteps that led to its early cancellation. Obviously, there will be spoilers for the entire franchise. Let's get into it. Gossip Girl first began as a series of young adult novels written by Cecily Von Zegeser, with the first installment being released in April 2002. The book followed the scandalous exploits of a group of privileged teenagers who attended an elite private school on the Upper East Side, with said exploits being documented and discussed online via the popular anonymous blogger Gossip Girl. After 11 books, the series finally reached its conclusion in 2007, with the main characters graduating from high school and moving on to other pursuits. The books received both positive and negative attention. On the positive side of things, it was praised for getting more teenagers into reading, but criticisms were directed at its inclusion of profanity, drug use, and sex acts, which people considered to be inappropriate for its target audience, with author Naomi Wolf saying of the series, quote, this is not the frank sexual exploration found in a Judy Bloom novel, but teenage sexuality via Juicy Couture, blasé and entirely commodified. The book series was initially supposed to be adapted into a film starring Lindsay Lohan, but the project struggled to get off the ground, and it was later retooled by Stephanie Savage and Josh Schwartz for television. Schwartz, who had created the 2003 teen drama The O.C., took Gossip Girl in a similarly soap opera-esque direction for The C.W., but considering the subject matter in the books, this wasn't an odd decision. The television production wholly embraced the controversial material of the books, and even used its scandalous reputation to its benefit, with ads for the TV series including quotes about how inappropriate it was, accompanied by steamy photos of its young cast. Airing from 2007 to 2013, the show was loosely inspired by the novels, featuring many of the same characters but changing their personalities and storylines as necessary, with Chuck Bass, Dan and Jenny Humphrey, and Vanessa Abrams getting significantly more attention than they had originally. Some notable plot points that differ between the book series and the TV show is that Jenny Humphrey idolizes Serena Vanderwoodson, not Blair Waldorf. Dan and Chuck have relationships with both men and women, and most notably, in the books the identity of Gossip Girl is never revealed. The show also takes place over a longer period of time, with the characters starting off in high school, then kinda sorta attending college, before getting married and having children. Speaking of marriages, they end up in very different relationships in the show versus the books, with Dan winding up with Serena instead of Vanessa, and Blair with Chuck instead of Nate. While avid fans of the book series were no doubt disappointed by these changes, there's no denying that they led to a far more interesting dynamic amongst the principal cast. The series' initial success has been credited to a few factors, one of course being the popularity of the novels, but I personally think a large part of it had to do with timing. During the 2000s, reality TV had seen a giant burst in popularity, with The Hills, The Simple Life, and The Real Housewives highlighting America's fascination with the scandalous lives and ridiculous exploits of the rich and famous. Not to mention that with shows like Seventh Heaven, Gilmore Girls, The O.C., and Dawson's Creek reaching their conclusion, there was a gap in the market that needed to be filled. Another thing that made the series so relevant for the times was that it came out when gossip sites like TMZ and Perez Hilton were all the rage. As a result, the Gossip Girl blog was something that teens could see as being trendy, while still being rooted in reality. Gossip Girl was also seen as a spiritual successor to Sex and the City, with both series having an emphasis on romantic and social drama, fashion, and New York extravagance. The social climate at the time also had an effect on the show's popularity. 
With the 2008 recession affecting millions of people, Gossip Girl served as a form of escapism, with the characters living glitzy and glamorous lives that most of its audience could only dream about. Like any franchise that had proven financially lucrative, Gossip Girl spawned several international adaptations including The Turkish Little Secrets in 2010 and Gossip Girl Thailand in 2015. Many of these international adaptations followed the format of the original TV series, down to the characters' personalities, storylines, and clothing. However, this lack of ingenuity and creativity led to most of these projects failing to strike a chord with audiences, and they rarely made it past their first initial season, proving that Gossip Girl's formula didn't immediately equate to success. In the 2000s and early 2010s, young adult dramas were thriving with shows like Pretty Little Liars, Rain, Teen Wolf, Greek, The Secret Life of the American Teenager, Skins, and The Vampire Diaries being popular. This trend continued into the mid-2010s, with Riverdale, 13 Reasons Why, Euphoria, and The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina seeing varying levels of critical and commercial success. With teen dramas seeing lasting success over the past two decades, combined with Hollywood's recent fascination with revivals and reboots, it's hardly a surprise that in 2021, Gossip Girl was pushed back into the spotlight and down our throats. Now I have to admit that right from the start, the odds weren't in Gossip Girl's favor, as it was often compared to other TV show reboots and revivals like Charmed, Fuller House, and Dynasty. But unlike some of these other shows, I truly think that the Gossip Girl revival had potential. It just failed to live up to it. In case you're unfamiliar with the revival storyline and characters, allow me to briefly summarize what happens. Zoya Lott is a new student at Constance who is secretly the half-sister of Instagram influencer and it girl Julian Calloway. Julian's closest friends are Audrey Hope, Luna Law, Max Wolf, Aki Menzies, and Monet Dehan. Audrey and Aki are dating, but there's sexual tension between them and Max, who is the pansexual playboy of the group. Monet and Luna are Julian's lackeys, in a sense, with Monet being her stylist and Luna her photographer, but the two are also the bullies of the group. After one of the school's teachers is fired at their privileged student's insistence, the rest of the faculty, led by Kate Keller, decide to teach them all a lesson and restart Gossip Girl on social media to get even. Julian attempts to bring Zoya into her circle, but the rest of her friends balk at the idea. Gossip Girl begins sharing information about the friend group, and soon enough they all begin to turn on each other. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, that's part of the problem. One issue I had with the revival is that it didn't bother bringing anything new to the table. The only notable differences from the original are its diversity, political messaging, and pop culture references. So for the most part, if you've seen one, then you've seen the other. Compare that to 2022's Pretty Little Liars Original Sin. Unlike other shows in the Pretty Little Liars franchise, it's less mystery drama and more horror slasher, which allows it to stand on its own, thereby allowing it to reach a wider audience than the usual revival. Compared to the 2000s, teens today are far more politically aware, so it makes sense that the Gossip Girl revival would attempt to showcase this. However, they go about it in the wrong ways, coming across as disingenuous and patronizing. It often feels as though it's patting itself on the back for being so progressive and woke, when in actuality it's addressing these issues in a very shallow and surface level manner. The original show is sometimes hard to watch in retrospect because it includes plot lines that would be addressed in a very different manner today. The reboot goes out of its way to repeat these scenarios but through a 2020s lens by condemning the behavior. This would be great if it weren't for the fact that many of the people involved with the original production, therefore the ones who gave permission for those things in the first place, are the same ones now attempting to be like, oh see, we're so much better than that show. The original characters were toxic and terrible, but at least they weren't lecturing each other and the audience about their ethical and moral superiority. These new, equally wealthy characters are constantly trying to prove that they're progressive, but the son of a multi-millionaire attempting to be one of the people isn't interesting, it's condescending, like Jeff Bezos thanking his overworked and underpaid employees for helping him get to outer space. Maybe it's just me, but I don't need relatable rich people who go, boo hoo, it's not my fault my daddy is a millionaire. I want rich people who are so horrible that there's no way of excusing their behavior, but they manage to weasel their way out of situations purely because they're well off and privileged. Show me assholes with no redeemable qualities, who epitomize the selfishness and shallowness of the upper class, then knock them down from their thrones. 
You could also show how two-faced and malicious they were by having them be vocal about these causes in public, posting on Instagram, going to protests, etc., but in private have them talk about how they don't believe in these issues at all, which wouldn't be far off from the real 1% who are similarly all talk and no action. That sort of direction is why series like Succession and White Lotus have been so successful. By emphasizing these toxic traits and their privilege, it would make the differences between these hyper-rich characters and those that are less well-off, like Zoya or the teachers, more stark. Now, I don't think anyone would deny that the revival is more racially and sexually diverse than its predecessor, but I personally don't think we should be handing out brownie points for something that should be considered the bare minimum, especially when these diverse characters are so one note, being nothing more than a handful of random quirks and traits in a sweater vest, with their actions having such little reasoning behind them that you're left wondering how they got to that conclusion in the first place. The characters in the original series were by no means perfect, but at least they had personalities that were unique to them and were easily identifiable. Sure, Serena Vanderwoodson made terrible choices when it came to men, but we understand that this is because the character is both a hopeless romantic and a cynic, something which is a direct result of seeing her mother's many failed relationships. So no matter how many times Serena falls for the wrong guy, or screws things up with the right one, it's believable. Blair Waldorf could have easily been nothing more than the bitchy Queen Bee, but early on in the series it's made clear that her arrogance is just a cover for her insecurities, which paves the way for most of the characters' decisions. Chuck Bass is a self-centered sociopath who is willing to do or say anything as long as it gets him what he wants, which serves as the inspiration for his more manipulative and malicious behavior. Jenny Humphrey started off as a sweet and submissive girl with a desire for popularity, before eventually becoming cold and calculating as a direct response to how people had treated her in the past. The main cast in the Revival series are sorely missing these developed personalities, which results in lackluster storylines for the lot of them, and they're so uninteresting that I'm often left wondering why anyone would spend the time gossiping about them to begin with. Because Aki's entire personality is that he's shy and kind of dumb, he mainly serves as comic relief, and he spends the series struggling to express his feelings and doing whatever other people tell him to do. There's nothing wrong with a more introverted character, but we're never given any insight into why he acts this way. As for Audrey, a large part of her character is her nonchalance, which is an incredibly uninteresting choice for a character's main personality trait, and because she doesn't care about anything, the audience doesn't care about her. As for Obi and Max, they're such bland characters that I don't even know if I could describe them as anything besides whiny and horny. I was especially disappointed with the show's depiction of Luna. While I appreciate that they didn't make her entire storyline about her trans identity, we learn very little about the character in the first season, and her sassy personality isn't particularly unique in the grand scheme of things. Julian is supposed to be the show's queen bee, but you never buy it for a minute. While she's somewhat vain and arrogant, she is none of the bite of Blair Waldorf or Jenny Humphrey, and lets everyone else do her dirty work for her. The only thing that makes her somewhat unique compared to the rest of her peers is that she's an Instagram influencer, which I'm sorry, is just not a character trait that lends itself to making someone look cool, especially when she's plugging bizarre products. Also, a true queen bee is someone who has total control over her subjects. She wouldn't have to scheme, she'd just tell them how it is. But instead, Julian needs other people to pick out her outfits. She falls victim to simple manipulation, and she cries whenever she has to do something mean. She's also way too level-headed and forgiving. Like, she doesn't even get a little bit angry at Zoya for stealing her boyfriend. Come on. Because of this, it's difficult to take Julian seriously as a leader, making her place within the school's hierarchy and the friend group questionable at best. Monet is by far the most interesting character, with her standoffish and domineering behavior being in response to her parents' treatment of her, with Monet wanting to be loved but being so afraid of being hurt that she'd rather be hated instead. Monet actually does things that sets the story in motion, while Julian sits around waiting for things to happen to her, which makes the choice to make her the series it girl utterly bizarre. I personally would have preferred if Monet had been the Queen Bee all along, especially because she's one of the only characters with the charisma to lead a show of this scale. With the characters' personalities being so one note, their dynamic is similarly affected, and as a result it's impossible to take the main friend group seriously, even though that's literally supposed to be one of the focal points of the series. 
When we meet everyone, they're all on good terms. But because none of their personalities are ever fleshed out, and we're told about their bond instead of shown it, this supposed friendship feels incredibly shallow, and when they have their ups and downs, we don't really care, because there's no sense that there's anything important at stake. Whereas when it came to Blair and Serena, we were constantly rooting for them to reconcile because they've been in each other's lives for such a long time. But conversely, we can understand that this closeness is precisely why they're fated to butt heads for eternity. The revival feels less like a show about a group of friends dealing with an online foe, and more like a bunch of random acquaintances who were locked in a room together. The grouping of Aki, Audrey, and Max makes a decent amount of sense since they're childhood friends, but at no point are we given any insight into how or why they befriended everyone else, and considering their main storyline throughout the series is centered around the three of them, they're barely integrated into the rest of the story and the drama. Monet and Luna begin the series as Julian's lackeys, so once they have a falling out with her, it makes their connection to each other and the rest of the group tenuous at best especially since both were supposedly using Julian to get ahead, and therefore shouldn't care about each other beyond that. With Zoya and Julian being half-sisters, they have the strongest bond in the series, but because they don't have any ties to other characters, there isn't much for them to do besides fight amongst themselves, although admittedly, Zoya does a lot more of the fighting. Because Obi's entire shtick is how bad he feels about growing up rich, it hardly comes as a surprise that he dumps Julian for the less wealthy Zoya, but this also leaves him without anyone to interact with because her character hasn't built up a rapport with anyone else. The original series sets up each character's role within the friend group right from the start, giving them a purpose. Blair, Serena, and Nate have been friends since they were kids, and this dynamic is what drives most of the conflict in the first season. Dan and Jenny are both outsiders, with Jenny aspiring to be like Blair, while Dan is enthralled by Serena. This gives both of these characters a clear role within the story, while simultaneously giving them a reason to interact with the others, even if they don't have a shared history. While Chuck and Nate's friendship is rather shallow, mostly stemming from them attending the same school and being similarly wealthy, Chuck's vain and manipulative nature make him and Blair a perfect match, thereby tying him to the group that way. Even Vanessa gets a solid backstory, with her and Dan once having feelings for each other, which makes her a thorn in Serena's side. Because these bonds are clearly established and defined, it allows the story to progress in a natural and believable manner, and we can draw conclusions about certain character dynamics even if it isn't explicitly stated. So two seemingly unrelated people, like Chuck and Vanessa, can interact in a way that doesn't feel forced. Whereas in the revival, if you put Max and Zoya in a scene alone together, there'd be nothing for them to do. Another problem I had with the revival is the fact that Gossip Girl's identity is revealed in the very first episode. While some might argue that this was purposeful in order to subvert audiences' expectations, that mystery was part of the appeal of the original series, and a large reason as to why many people kept tuning in year after year. Sure, the reveal that Dan Humphrey was Gossip Girl all along was pretty lame, especially when Eric or Dorota were far better options, but we still got to theorize about who it could be for years. By immediately revealing Gossip Girl to be the teachers at Constance, one of the main intrigues of the show is removed, and we're less invested in the story as a result. Imagine if we'd found out who A was in the very first episode of Pretty Little Liars. Not that interesting anymore, huh? Not to mention that the teachers' motivations are rather lackluster. It seems as though the show almost wants to justify their actions by implying that they're getting back at the kids for their wrongdoings, but instead it just feels petty and immature, making them all instantly unlikable. Plus, they're just so inept at their task that it's pathetic. With technology being even more prevalent today than it was when the original series aired, it would have been more interesting to keep Gossip Girl's identity a secret the entire time to really highlight how social media allows anonymity to thrive, something that many people abuse. While the revival did update the platform from a blog to Instagram, a la Dumois, it doesn't do anything else to reflect how times have changed. It would have been funny if after reaching a certain level of success, Gossip Girl had started using the site just as an influencer would have by doing sponsored posts, which could have been a clever commentary on social media marketing. Then you could have gone a step further by addressing stan culture, parasocial relationships, and being chronically online. The original characters lived in an age before followers, which is what made their popularity so interesting. They hadn't done anything to deserve it. 
The revival stumbles by trying to justify Julian's popularity by making her an Instagram influencer, but it doesn't seem as though the showrunners have any understanding of how Instagram actually works. The character is supposed to have millions of Instagram followers, which is basically celebrity status, and yet she's worrying about engagement and how to get brand deals? That's not how it works. I really wish that they'd gone with a sort of Devin Lee Carlson or Matilda Durfrout, with the character using their online fame to start a successful side business. Imagine how interesting it'd be if she hadn't been wealthy from the get-go, but her online presence and smarts had been able to make her just as rich as the rest of the kids. She'd be new money in a world of old money. That would have been an interesting subversion of the original Gossip Girl, which was all about rich kids who had things handed to them. Plus, it'd make Gossip Girl more of a threat, as Julian's public image is directly connected to her success. What makes the show truly unbearable to watch is the acting, which sounds harsh, I know, but it has to be said. Most of the actors in the series are in the very early stages of their careers, and you can really tell. They're never able to nail the tongue-in-cheek humor that the show is trying to achieve, and the heartfelt moments fall completely flat. Now, I'm not saying that the acting on the original series was Oscar-worthy, but at least they had a range of emotion. The characters in the revival deliver every line like they're ordering a sandwich. Despite all of these obvious issues, the show took itself way too seriously. The original series wasn't without flaws, but it at least understood where it fit in the grand scheme of things, allowing itself to lean into classic soap opera tropes like secret siblings, wealth-seeking imposters, and fake deaths. This absurdity was part of its charm, but the revival instead opted for believability, something that has no place in a teen drama. Other than being shot beautifully and having decent costumes, I don't have many positive things to say about the Gossip Girl revival, so I won't lie, I'm kind of relieved to hear that it's ending. I just hope that whenever Hollywood decides to revisit the franchise, because they will, that they actually take the time to create an interesting story. What did you think of the Gossip Girl revival? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!